Good afternoon, everybody. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be at the IMA headquarters in New Delhi and to have the opportunity of talking to thousands of my fellow members. In the next 900 seconds, I hope to convince every one of you that the time has now come where telemedicine has to be necessarily incorporated into the core of the healthcare delivery system. It has taken us 15 years to create some sort of awareness, do pilot projects, proof of concept validations, etc. It was indeed thrilling that the Prime Minister of India mentioned the word telemedicine thrice in his Independence Day speech. What is the method of achieving cost-effective, affordable healthcare to anyone, anytime, anywhere? We are all familiar with statistics. We all know the urban-rural health divide. We know that not in the life of my great-grandchildren will we have specialists and super-specialists physically available in suburban India and the towns of India, let alone the villages. There is a gross disparity in availability and access to affordable quality health care. Innovative use of information and communication technology alone, ladies and gentlemen, will be the answer. However, this does not become a solution unless it is available to everyone, every time, everywhere. We have to create what I would like to call a customer delight environment. The service which we offer must be cost-effective, need-based, appropriate technology without compromising on quality using appropriate technology which the end user is familiar with. So what answers this? In my opinion, telehealth is the only answer and no other substitute. We have to understand and accept the fact that we are living in a changing ecosystem. In the next few years, doctors will no longer have to go to hospitals. Hospitals should be the last stop for tertiary care, primary health care and perhaps even some amount of secondary health care should be delivered at the doorsteps of the patient. Today, it is possible to have a laboratory in your pocket, a doctor in your pocket, in fact, even a hospital in your pocket. Contextualized Personalized medicine is the future and of course most important there will be an increased quality of service. I recollect with nostalgia as you can see from this slide as early as 1998 I had addressed a letter to the secretary of the Association of Rural Surgeons of India requesting them to consider using telemedicine. I had received a reply expressing their interest. But then retrospectively, I was just too far ahead of the time. Today, technology is available, the culture has changed, and the time is now right. It was Walter Hugo who once remarked, nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. Why do I want telemedicine? Consider the effort involved in seeing a doctor, making an appointment, traveling to the doctor's clinic or hospital, and this may take half an hour, one hour, several hours. A recent study showed that in several states in India, a person has to travel 30 kilometers to 70 kilometers for secondary care, forget tertiary care. Again, waiting in line with other patients, following up with diagnostic tests, the slide says it all. And most important, as a continuous communication between the doctor and the employee, where both can see each other through a video system, this will be able to replace a face-to-face -face encounter. What are the advantages of telemedicine? Makes the right expertise available everywhere. Today, we all know that 80% of specialists cater physically to 20% of India's population. More important, it will reduce unnecessary patient transfers. Several studies have demonstrated that less than 20% of patients need to physically come to a tertiary care hospital, whether it be the uh, teaching institution or whether it be a corporate hospital. One can even provide tele-emergency services. 
effective utilization of transportation would be better and tertiary hospitals would not be spending their time doing managing patients who could very equally well be managed in the primary place where they were located. However, telemedicine is not easy to incorporate. Studies have shown that physician acceptance is probably the single most important barrier to the adoption of telehealth. For some reason or the other, all over the world, physicians are still wary of giving an opinion and seeing a patient on a big screen. Evidence-based medicine, there is no evidence-based medicine which says that physical examination of a patient is mandatory to make the correct diagnosis. Today, video conferencing has become so sophisticated, connectivity has become so sophisticated, hardware, software, middleware, brainware, everything is available that today distance has become meaningless and geography has in fact become history. One of my favorite phrases is YFM. It is not Wi-Fi which is a problem. It is not Ymax which is a problem. It is YFM. And what do I mean by WIIFM? What is in it for me? At the end of the day, every single stakeholder in the healthcare ecosystem embracing telemedicine must be rewarded. This reward could be monetary, this reward could be otherwise. A recent study in the United States showed that when US health insurance companies recognized teleconsultation for reimbursement in some states, the adoption of telemedicine increased 20 times. So reimbursement is a major factor and of course connectivity is still not available in major parts of rural India but I am sure in the next few years this problem is going to be sorted out. What are the challenges involved in a telemedicine network? As you can see in this slide there are many. It could be lack of basic facilities, lack of skilled manpower, Human resources, trained human resources are not available and just the lack of ability to afford a specialist teleconsultation. I strongly feel again that health insurance is the only way we can provide health care to everyone and teleconsultation should obviously be a part of this. Lack of proper infrastructure, connectivity issues. But for every one of the challenges which have been identified, there is a potential resolution. It may take time, but certainly it is on the anvil and this is going to happen. Intensive care units. Today we all know that there are very, very few intensive care units when you compare to the large number of 35,000 hospitals. The EICU is already being adopted in several parts of this country where a group of intensivists will be able to monitor intensive care units in smaller hospitals and studies have shown that significant difference in mortality and morbidity when you have a remote intensivist. Over the last 4-15 years when I have been deeply involved in telemedicine, I have been convinced that the primary problem is not technology, not even funding, not hardware, software, but most important what I would like to call change management. It is extremely difficult for doctors like us trained in the BC era, at least I was trained in the BC era before computers and before Christ are one and the same to assume and to understand that it is not essential that a patient is physically in front of you. You can see him on a smartphone, on a tablet, on a laptop, on a desktop. And again, people raise the bogey of medical legal issues. Luckily, India is not primarily a litigious society and as of today, there are no definite rules endorsing telemedicine, neither are there rules stating that a remote consultation should not be given. Unnecessary apprehension among doctors should be totally removed and believe it or not, once you start using it, it's fun to enjoy it and believe me, you will become addicted to the use of telemedicine like me. Statistics have shown very clearly that the, there is an exponential increase in the use of information and communication technology. Very soon we are going to reach the 1 billion mark. 925 million mobile phones, 25% of which are smart. 320 million people access the internet today and the majority have started accessing it through wireless. 
Again, the Universal Service Obligation Fund, the, the, the BSNL's counterpart, the BBNL, Bharat Broadband Nigam Limited, the National Optic Fiber Cable Co Company, all this have, and we are going to ensure that at least 100,000 villages in India do have access to broadband within the next couple of years. Technology is changing, not weekly, not even daily, but hourly. I do not want to look at telemedicine in isolation. We should look at digital health, e-health, m-health, etc. And I think it's unfair in 2015 to treat a patient without having access to an electronic medical record. Easier said than done. But it is we, the doctors, who need to go to the administrators and tell them that we need EMR, we need telemedicine, we need digital healthcare, not just more sophisticated CT scans, more sophisticated operating microscopes and theatres, etc. But equally important is digital healthcare. I'm just going to show you a few clinical examples. Now, here is a photograph taken 13 years ago when neurological teleconsultations were done. It takes a trained person like me hardly 90 seconds to make a clinical diagnosis when the case is obvious. Here is an example of an unconscious head injury patient at Port Blair, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, 1,800 miles away from mainland India, whom I ma successfully managed right from through teleconsultation from my house 10 days later this unconscious patient was discharged the next slide as you can see was an opinion given on a meningomyelocele on a baby born 60 minutes after the child was delivered again in port blair andaman and nicobar islands without telemedicine it would have been impossible for this baby to get a specialist opinion and all these are routine things which we do here is yet another example where a patient in extremis, I was consulted and I took the responsibility. I said, you enter in the case sheet, patient seen by me through telemedicine. This patient is not going to survive long. He's already jaw breathing. Both pupils dilated, need not be transferred to a tertiary care hospital. And just as predicted, he developed an irreversible cardiac arrest 30 minutes later. So this is the way telemedicine can act. Now here is an example, you can see how I managed a patient with a bilateral chronic subdural hematoma. You can see on the lower right hand side a video. I am doing a neurological examination in Tamil, the local language. This patient is in a town about 250 miles away from Chennai. I am asking him to walk. I am testing the cerebellar system. Ah, that's better. Ah, very good. Okay, right. Very good. This examination was done repeatedly over a period of six weeks. I was absolutely confident that I could manage him without surgery. And a fairly large bilateral chronic subdural hematoma, you can see, resolved completely purely by a tele examination. Now, I see no reason why. Hospital on wheels should not be part of every district hospital to provide specialist care. Today, we have shown with various pilot projects, as you can see in this slide, in Ajmer in February 12, 2012, 527 super specialist teleconsultations were done in 13 specialities in two days in about 14 hours. And how were we able to do it? We were able to do it because we had excellent connectivity provided to the hospital on wheels. I see no reason why every district hospital cannot have, cannot run telecams. These district hospitals can be connected to the major medical colleges in the capital of the state, can even be connected to the national institutes and super specialists sitting in the metros will be able to evaluate people through a hospital on wheels. We are particularly delighted that a tertiary corporate hospital is now embracing primary care. 
uh, the government of India, Department of Electronics and Information Technology has entrusted us with providing remote primary health care and in less than 17 months we have already established contact with 8,800 common service centers and we hope in the next year or so that the present 100-125 teleconsultations per day will significantly increase tenfold or twentyfold. This slide again shows a few examples of how people are slowly accepting the fact that it is possible to see a doctor through an internet enabled kiosk in a village. To me the most exciting thing in the future of telemedicine is what I would like to call point of care diagnostics. As doctors we are all familiar with a glucometer but many of us may not be aware that just like a glucometer, a glucose strip Today we can do liver function tests, renal function tests, cardiovascular evaluation, cholesterol, triglycerides, lipid profile and electrolytes and so on and so forth. All this can be done anywhere or of course the, the equipment is still a little expensive but it's just a question of time before the prices come down. So what more do you want? You can do a non-communicable diseases mini master health checkup screening in the towns of India, in the villages of India and through telemedicine ensure that an internist, an MD, general medicine or a specialist evaluates these results. Teleradiology, we all know that while we have thousands of CT scans in the country and hundreds of MRIs, the major part in suburban and rural India still do not have even conventional x-rays. Today with digital radiography, the limited number of radiologists reach can be extended and with simple software, simple connectivity, teleradiology can be extended much more. Over the last two years, I have been convinced that promoting health literacy is the way to go by. 90% of open heart surgeries could have been avoided in the first place. Even today in a big city like Chennai, we see hypertensive intracerebral hematomas leading to a devastating stroke all because the patient was not aware that he was a hypertensive or did not take adequate precautionary measure. With modern technology as we have demonstrated in a pilot project, it is possible to reach, to touch literally hundreds of millions of lives. In a small project with the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, we have more than 10,000 villagers have listened to 47 different talks given by consultants from Tamil Nadu in Tamil. Is it a few mad doctors who are trying to spread telemedicine? In order to answer this question, we did a pan-India survey, a statistical evaluation of more than 1,800 people spread across seven states. It was very, 57% uh, was urban and the balance was rural. It was extremely reassuring, uh, reassuring to realize that the majority of the respondents in this study said that if they had health care through their mobile phone, they would certainly embrace it and they would be willing to pay for it. And the next two slides are just to show how telemedicine in India has been recognized. Two, three years ago, the then health minister of India raised the topic of compulsory rural services. There was a hue and cry and most doctors in India pointed out the considerable difficulties in practically implementing this project. To the members of the IMA, I have a suggestion. I am sure if the IMA really embraces it, 225,000 members, please, please, if every one of us decide to spare one hour per week providing free or on a small token honorarium of virtual rural teleservices. I'm sure the government is in a position today to put, raise the infrastructure, the technology, everything can be done. We will be able to provide 200,000 hours of rural service per week. This is all that we are asking and I do hope that this message will go through and I look forward to the day when IMA will be able to do this. So, ladies and gentlemen, the last slide which I want to convey to you is an in-depth research study which I have carried out and it is going to be published in the next week or so. This is solid scientific data. Check, double check, triple check. 934.88 million Indians do not have physical access to a neurologist or neurosurgeon. 
30% of my colleagues like me live in Mumbai, Chennai, Delhi, Kolkata. Another 30% live in state capitals. Another 30% live in tier 2 cities. 7% only live in tier 3 cities. And less than 3% live in rural areas catering to 9, 89 million people, 85 million people. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the real India. And this is not going to change, not over the next 75 to 100 years. I have no reason to believe that the statistics will in any way be different, whether it is endocrinology, cardiology, cardiac surgery, plastic surgery, or what have you. Not only tertiary care, but even secondary care. Is it not time now that our brethren don't just have access to PHCs, not just have access to primary care. Nothing prevents a villager from developing a brain tumor, from requiring a bone marrow transplant and an open heart surgery. We as members of the Indian Medical Association need to provide secondary, tertiary and even tele-triage for quaternary care to suburban and rural India. And telemedicine is the only way in which this can be done. I would like to quote Albert Einstein who said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. In conclusion, I think adoption of healthcare information technology in a broader sense of the term is mandatory. We are doing a disservice to our clients, to our patients, if we do not embrace healthcare information technology. And I'm particularly happy that IMA is a knowledge partner for the 6th International Conference on Transforming Healthcare with IT. We are delighted that the Indian Medical Association recognized March 24th as IMA National Telemedicine Day. It was exactly 15 years ago to the day on March 24, 2000 that Bill Clinton, the then President of the US, formally commissioned the world's first VSAT-enabled village hospital in the village of Aragonda in Andhra Pradesh. Over the last 15 years, the progress has been slow, though it could have been much better than what it was. We now believe that we will very soon, by the end of this year, with the help and support of IMA, reach that critical mass so essential for a successful takeoff. So once again, I would like to thank the IMA for inviting me to give this talk. I remember when I'm showing you the last slide that I belong to the BC era. If somebody like me, a senior citizen, can embrace, can adopt, can fall in love with healthcare information technology, I see no reason why the younger people cannot do this. Marty Cooper, the inventor of the mobile phone, whom I had the pleasure of interacting with, could never ever have foreseen that he would disprove Charles Darwin. Instead of thousands of years, a new species, Homo mobilicus. I was born as Homo sapiens, but my grandson has been born as Homo mobilicus. This new species, Homo mobilicus, has evolved in just in four decades with more mutations in emerging economies. Today, 5.5 out of 7 billion Homo sapiens have become Homo mobilicus. To me, chips were something I ate. Discs were part of the spinal column. A tablet was something which I prescribed. And semiconductors were people wishing they were heading an orchestra. But to the present generation, a disc, a chip, a tablet, conductors, every one of them connotes a different meaning. So, ladies and gentlemen, the time has certainly come for us to use the Homo mobilicus title which we all have for the betterment of our brethren and please, please do use telemedicine, healthcare information technology. This is a win-win situation. It will not only help our patients, it will help ourselves. Thank you once again for inviting me.